So today I've actually decided to release all the remaining parts of this video and it's contraceptive week and it's concluding today. So do whatever you want with this information. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazivu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today in this video, we're going to be looking at the intrauterine systems as well as devices. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. In the previous videos, we looked at contraceptive basics, oral contraceptives, transdermal and vaginal ring hormonal contraceptives, injectable contraceptives, as well as implants. In this video, we will look at intrauterine systems and devices. So remember from our basics, contraception is pretty much the intentional prevention of conception through various devices, sexual practices, chemicals, drugs, or surgical procedures. It can be classified into different groups. We looked at some of the hormonal-based contraceptive methods. We talked about them. We also looked at, uh, we're going to look at rather, some of the non-hormonal based methods and pretty much the surgical methods which we'll cover in the subsequent lectures. So remember when it comes to the intrauterine devices, these ones are much more popular because of the advantage as being an effective method of contraception and they have minimal side effects. They can also be changed only about three years, five years, eight years. Some of them can even go as far as 10 years, avoiding the need for you to remember to take a form of contraception, maybe weekly or maybe even form of contraception daily or even monthly. So these ones have a much better compliancy than the other methods. It is also ideal for those women that actually want medium to long term use without actually having permanent uh, contraception. For those that want to have this long term method, then for those that also don't want any intercourse dependent uh, type of contraception and those that have a problem with compliance, intrauterine devices and systems are the way to go. Remember that these are also going to be protecting against both intrauterine and ectopic pregnancy. But what you need to remember is if a pregnancy does occur with these intrauterine devices, it will more likely be an ectopic pregnancy. And fitting of an IUD is going to be performed by a trained healthcare personnel. And it's, it's actually a brief procedure. It's going to be associated with mild to moderate discomfort. I will leave a link in the description to videos that I want you guys to watch about insertion and removal of the intrauterine devices. Remember also that a fine thread is left protruding from the cervix into the vagina and the IUD can actually be removed in due course by just pulling on the threads. So in terms of the intrauterine devices, we have two main types. These are live on gestural releasing intrauterine devices and the ones that have copper in them, the copper bearing intrauterine devices depicted on the picture on the right. So remember that the level and gestural releasing intrauterine devices are going to be including those that have 13.5 uh, milligrams of um, the level and gestural. They release about 14 micrograms a day and they remain effective for about three years. And this has a three year cumulative pregnancy rate of about 1%, which is quite low compared to the other contraceptive methods. You also have one that contains 19.5 milligrams that's releasing about 17.5 micrograms a day and it's effective for about five years with a cumulative five-year pregnancy rate of 0 0.9 to 1.4 percent. We also have those that have uh, 252 milligrams of IU intrauterine uh, devices and these are releasing initially 20 micrograms a day then they decline to 10 micrograms a day after five years and these remain effective for about eight years with a cumulative uh, eight-year pregnancy rate of 0 0.5 to about 1.1 percent most of them as you can see are less than two percent pregnancy rates remember that the ones that are going to be releasing the hormones, one example is Mirena, and it's going to have a capsule that's going to be consisting of levonorgestrel around the stem that's going to be releasing a daily dose of about 20 micrograms per day. It's going to be associated with a dramatic reduction in the menstrual blood flow, and you can actually be licensed for the use in, for example, people that have heavy menstrual bleeding as part also of hormonal replacement therapy. Here is an example of a hormonal releasing intrauterine system, a Mirena, as depicted on the right of your screen. 
Remember that the intrauterine copper contraception is actually quite effective for 10 years. It has a cumulative 12-year pregnancy rate of less than 2%. And they're going to be available in various different shapes and sizes. They are going to be cause much less menstrual disruption because they don't have hormones. And compared to those that were made from plastic devices, which are now no longer being used. Most of the copper IUDs are actually licensed for 10-year use, although the smaller devices may be used for only about five years. In our setting here, we keep them for at most five years. Then the more copper the device actually is going to be having, the more effective it's going to be, and the modern brands or the modern um, banded uh, devices are going to have copper in the stem, and they're also going to have copper sleeves on the arms. Remember that an injury train device without a frame, which consists of these six beads uh, on the proline thread, has actually been developed and is actually anchored to the uterine fundus with a knot. Gainfix is actually a type that you can just Google Gainfix and you actually have a look at what it looks like. So here's a comparison between the ones that bear copper and the ones that are hormonal releasing. As we can see, the failure rates are much higher with the copper and they are lower with the hormonal based with the copper 0.8 with the hormonal based 0.1 the mode of action of the copper intrauterine device is going to create this toxic effect on both the sperm and the egg that's going to be acting prior to fertilization so it creates a hostile environment in the uterus and the ones that are going to be consisting of levonorgestrel will work just like any other contraception that has a progestin. So they're going to have this local hormonal effect on the cervical mucus and the endometrium. They cause it to become atrophic and very difficult for the um, fertilized egg to implant. The copper IUCD can be uh, put for 10 years. The marina can be put for 5 years. And the copper has, uh, the periods can become heavier with more pain with a copper device. And the periods can become irregular and much, much lighter with some women actually being amenoric with the marina, the hormonal impregnated devices. Then you often get some uh, more spotting uh, before and after the periods with the copper devices and with the hormonal impregnated devices. It's this erratic spotting that's very common. And initially it's going to be going to settle after some time. There are no hormonal effects with the copper IUCD and there are no therapeutic benefits. But with the marina that consists of levonorgestrel, it actually may cause a greasier skin, it may cause acne, it may cause breast tenderness, mood swings, but generally the symptoms often tend to settle with time. And it may also be used to help the heavy and painful periods and it can also be used as part of hormone replacement therapy. Now, in terms of insertion of an IUD, remember that clinicians do not need to do a pap smear or to test for HPV before inserting the IUD, unless if the patient is due for cervical cancer screening. The tests for the sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea and chlamydia should be done prior to insertion and should be based on risk assessment. So those that are less than 25 years, those with multiple sexual partners, those that have inconsistent condom use, and those that have had a history of sexually transmitted infections. However, the clinicians must not wait to get results if, before you actually insert the IUD. And if the results are positive, then the patient is going to be treated with appropriate antibiotics and the IUD is actually left in place. And if you have a prolent cervical discharge that's observed before you plan on inserting the IUD, then you should not insert the IUD. You must first test for the sexually transmitted infections. And if they're present, then you should treat them. Then the IUCD should be treated after, it should be inserted after the treatment actually has been completed. Remember that the package insert for the IUD should be read thoroughly before you actually insert the IUD because it has some instructions on how to insert the IUD. Then when the IUD is actually inserted, then we must use a sterile technique. Like I said, I will leave a link to a video of an IUCD insertion and removal in the description below. Mm -hmm. Then remember that a bimanual examination should be done to confirm the position of the uterus and a tenaculum should be placed on the anterior lip of the cervix to stabilize the uterus and to straighten the uterine axis. And this may actually help with the correct placement of the IUD. A uh, uterine sound device can actually be used to measure the length of the uterine cavity before you actually insert the IUD. Then before inserting the IUD, you want to perform a paracervical block that may decrease the pain during the insertion. You also want to insert it at any time during the menstrual cycle if a woman has not had a protected sexual intercourse during the past one month. 
And then a, a routine follow-up uh, after the IUD insertion is actually not necessary and patients should be counseled that they may uh, experience certain things, certain symptoms or complications like pain, heavy bleeding in terms of the copper IUD. They may have this abnormal vaginal discharge, fever, and sometimes it may be expelled. They may be expelled and the patient may actually become pregnant. There was actually a meme that I was seeing circulating around where someone had left an IUCD on a bus seat and then uh, the caption was talking about something as in someone is pregnant somewhere out there or they may be dissatisfied with the method. Then the IUD may be inserted immediately after an induced spontaneous abortion during the first and second trimester or it can be inserted immediately after delivery of the placenta even in a cesarean section delivery or vaginal delivery. Certain contraindications include to remember that most women can actually use the IUD, but generally those that are going to be falling under category four are going to be things like anatomic abnormalities that may distort the uterine cavity, such as a fibroids, do not insert an IUD. Uh, current pelvic uh, infection, such as a pelvic inflammatory disease, you want to treat that first. Any mucopurulent cervicitis with a suspected STI, uh, pelvic tuberculosis, a septic abortion, or popular endometritis, or sepsis within the past three months, you don't want to insert an IUCD or an IUD rather. If there's unexplained vaginal bleeding before the assessment, you do not want to insert one. If there's pregnancy, if we have any malignant gestational trophoblastic disease with persistently elevated serum beta ACG levels, uh, or this is a relative contraindication because the data that's there is really not so convincing. Then if there's a known cervical cancer or endometrial cancer, we want to first um, assess them and treat them before we actually insert the IUD. Then for levonorgestrel releasing IUDs, you don't want to insert them if they have any allergies to levonorgestrel, if they have breast cancer. Then for the copper, you don't want to insert them if they have Wilson's disease, which is a metabolic disease that is affecting the metabolism of copper, as well as allergies to copper. Indications or those that are falling under category one, these are going to be including conditions such as uh, contraindications to other forms of contraceptions that contain estrogen. For example, if a woman has a history of venal thrombosis, if they're smoking more than 15 cigarettes a day, if they're above the age of 35, if they have a migraine with aura, if they have a migraine of any type in a woman that's older than 35. These were contraindications that we saw in um, contraceptives that contained estrogen. Then a history of PID, STIs, or ectopic pregnancy, it does not it's not a contraindication, it's actually an indication and you can actually insert an IUD. If they are breastfeeding or they are adolescent, you can insert an IUD. And the patient's personal beliefs about abortion because the IUD are not abort efficient. However, if you are inserting a copper or a 52 milligram levonorgestrel IUD, if as a form of emergency contraception, it will actually prevent implantation of the blastocyst and this may actually possibly terminate a viable pregnancy. So there's a bit of some controversy with relation to that. Adverse effects include things like vaginal bleeding, which is often irregular in the first several months of insertion, especially with a levonorgestrel releasing IUD. The bleeding then is going to completely stop within one year in up to 20% of the women and some patients may consider this effect uh, a benefit of the IUD. Then an intrauterine copper contraception may actually cause heavier menstrual bleeding. It may cause severe cramping, which can be relieved by giving these patients NSAIDs like ibuprofen. Then remember that women should be told that these effects uh, are going to be there before you actually insert the IUD and you provide them with as much information as possible to help them choose whether they're going to go for the copper device or they're going to be going for the one that consists of hormones. Potential benefits are going to be including a decrease in the risk of endometrial cancer as well as ovarian cancer and data about whether there is increased risk of breast cancer is actually conflicting, especially with the liver and gestural releasing IUDs. Then if a woman has had unprotected intercourse within the past seven days, then an intrauterine corporate uh, contraception or a 52 milligrams levonorgestrel releasing IUD can be inserted as form of emergency contraception. I will give a video and talk about this in a subsequent video. And then complications are going to include, remember that uh, these IUDs can actually be expelled. So an average, uh, usually about less than 5% get expelled within the first year after insertion. However, the expulsion rates are higher if the IUD is actually inserted immediately less than 10 minutes after a delivery.
And then after insertion, the clinician actually confirms the correct placement at six weeks by looking for the strings attached to the IUD, which are typically trimmed to three centimeters from the external cervical ostium. Then the uterus can sometimes be perforated in about one in a thousand cases of IUD insertions. Remember that perforation typically is going to occur at the time of insertion of the IUD, and sometimes only the distal part of the IUD will penetrate. Then over the months, the uterine contractions can actually force the entire IUD to get into the peritoneum. And if the strings are not visible during the pelvic examination, then the clinician must do one of the following things. They must either use a cytobrush to attempt to sweep the strings out of the cervical canal. They must also gently probe the uterus with an IUD hook or a sound or a biopsy instrument unless if a pregnancy is suspected and they must be careful not to push the IUD further into the uterine cavity or into the myometrium. Then they should also get an ultrasound uh, and under ultrasound guidance with some alligator forceps to actually remove the IUD. Then if the IUD is not seen, an abdominal x-ray can actually be taken to exclude any intraperitoneal location. And remember that intraperitoneal IUDs may cause intestinal adhesions and the IUDs that have perforated the uterus are removed via laparoscopy or a laparotomy. And remember, if expulsion or pe uh, perforation is suspected, a backup contraceptive method should be used. In terms of other complications, you may rarely get salpingitis. That's a pelvic inflammatory disease that may develop in the first month of insertion because the bacteria are going to be displaced into the uterine cavity when you're inserting this device. But the risk is low and the routine antibiotic prophylaxis is not actually indicated. If the PID actually develops, give them antibiotics. The IUD actually needs to be removed, does not need to be removed rather, unless the infection persists despite antibiotics and the strings are not going to be providing access for bacteria except during the first months of insertion. Remember, IUDs do not increase the risk of pelvic disease, contrary to most popular belief. Then in a mutually monogamous relationship, an IUD user can actually have no increased risk of PID. If an IUD user has a partner with an STI such as chlamydia or gonorrhea, then the IUD will not protect against these infections. That's what you must remember in contrast to the condoms or the hormonal contraceptive methods which are going to protect against the infection to some extent. Then the users of the marina have some marginal lower over risk of pelvic infection because again these are going to be affecting the cervical mucus and they'll thicken it such that even the ascent of bacteria is much less. So these ones have a protective effect, the ones that contain the hormone, the progestin hormones. And then remember antibiotics are not given routinely during insertion of IUD but should be considered if a woman is thought to be at a higher risk or if there are limited facilities for STI screening. If the actinomyce-like organisms on the pap smear test in women are seen with no symptoms of infection, this does not require IUCD removal, it does not require antibiotics. Then the incidence of ectopic pregnancies, like I said, is much lower in patients with IUCD users, but when they do get pregnant, the risk of them developing uh, an ectopic pregnancy is slightly higher than the other population. So you must actually check for or get a scan done whenever this patient that had an IUCD actually develops uh, a pregnancy. So it's about 3 to 5% risk with the copper ones and less than 1% with the marina. Remember that the overall risk of ectopic pregnancy with the copper IUD is less than 1.5 per thousand women years uh, that are using IUD. I really hope you enjoyed this video on the intrauterine systems. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.